Well, you didn't hit the wrong channel button. You are watching Larry King Live. I'm Dr. Phil McGraw. I'm sitting in for Larry tonight. Joining us from New York, criminologist and attorney Casey Jordan. Casey, let me start with you. I'm not just a criminologist. I am really and truly a documentary aficionado. I love watching documentaries, and there's a lot of great ones out there, uh, and also a lot of really poor ones on true crime. The Netflix series Don't F*** With Cats, Hunting an Internet Killer is one of my favorites. I think it was handled extremely well, done very responsibly, and shows the good and the bad of cyber sleuthing and what can happen with crimes posted on social media and during live feeds. I knew about Luca Magnata because I was actually there in 2012 working full-time for CNN and HLN. I had just started a new series of my own on investigation discovery called Wives with Knives and I had an assistant who was managing my social media and in the summer of 2012 she reached out to me and said there is something online that is so uh, unsettling, disturbing, it's beyond the pale. And that's a tough call if you really want to see um, the original killing uh, by Luca Magnata. But what was even more disturbing to me was that he had started with cats. And this, of course, is classic for so many of our serial killers specifically. The trifecta of bedwetting, fire starting, and animal torture has almost always proven true. So. The idea that videos were out there of a man actually abusing, killing cats, videotaping it, which was new and different, and then putting it out there, clearly um, looking for attention, wanting to play a cat and mouse game, not just with the police, but with everyone online. It really raised some questions, not only about what kind of person would do this, but whether or not media, social media specifically, was feeding into his aberrant pathology. Luca Magnata himself is really a character worth studying. He was born to teenage parents in Toronto. Uh, he, his parents split up when he was young. He lived with his mother. She remarried. But he exhibited issues of mental illness very early on. He was homeschooled and then when he went to school he was bullied so his mother kept him at home. And that isolation uh, eventually ended him in a mental institution where he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, but didn't appear to get any help, was essentially unemployable, but fancied himself a model and an actor, and went out and did auditions, and, and really seemed to be buying into a delusion that he was going to be famous and rich someday. Clearly his crimes were based on a very deep-seated need, call it an obsession, for attention. And this need is going to grow deeper and deeper the more he tries to put himself out there as an actor and a model, and the more he fails, he doesn't make it. Nobody buys into his delusion. In Luca Magnata's mind, when he isn't making it as an actor or a model, he needs to find something new and different. The thrill of going on an audition needs to be replaced by a job, but if that can't happen, he needs to do whatever it is to get attention. And the internet and our obsession with social media provided the perfect vehicle for him to do unspeakable, heinous acts and instantly become famous. Based on what we know about serial killers, especially those that torture animals, and don't just do it once, but do it again on a trajectory with each incident getting worse and worse, designed for shock value, they have to graduate to something even more aberrant and horrible with each crime. Sometimes to fulfill their own personal needs and sometimes for shock value, but never forget the shock value on the outside world is fulfilling their personal needs. But if we hadn't caught him when we did, he would have come up, if it's possible, with something even worse to do on camera to keep that manhunt going. The documentary makes a very good point about that fine line between citizens helping the police actually try to solve crimes and getting in the way. Because at one point, this became such a steamroller once the video became viral and people were so outraged about the killing of the cats. People got involved to the point of getting in the way or maybe changing and redirecting Luca Magnata's behavior. And that's the risk of citizens getting involved in these crimes. 
at the same time, I'm 100% convinced this crime would not have been solved if it hadn't been for the cyber sleuths. The manhunt had begun. We knew who did it, but we didn't know where he had gone. And I was receiving a lot of calls from um, news stations in Toronto, specifically Sun News used me a number of times, and they were really trying to use these interviews as a vehicle for getting the word out there, getting the photo of Luca Magnata out there internationally with the hopes that some citizen would spot him and turn him in because no one really had much faith in the police who had been warned that this was coming. We trusted that they had put it out on Interpol, but they were like, the only way we're going to capture this guy with his skill set is to alert the entire public. So I had to basically analyze him and talk live on air about what kind of person he was, but never forgetting that he could be watching. And that's a certain kind of crime coverage because you never want to be responsible for alerting somebody that you are inside his mind. You tread a little lightly, you handle the facts with kid gloves and you don't ever insult or call them cowards or try to provoke them because they could kill again based on something you say on live news. But when I listened to the details and when I did all of my background research and when I actually saw the video he shot of what he did to Jun Lin, I knew that he was not only narcissistic, but that he literally had a movie reel going on in his head. And I even said that on Sun News. And I was picturing the movie Basic Instinct because it came out when I was 29 years old. Everyone went to see it. And I remember the scene from that, even though I hadn't seen the movie for so many years, being dramatically similar. So when I said he has a movie reel going on in his head, that was really kind of calling out his personality, that he wasn't really seeing himself do these things. He was picturing you watching him do these things. In criminology, this is a theory we call Cooley's looking glass self, which basically says they've lost touch with reality because everything they're doing is for an imaginary camera. But in this case, it wasn't an imaginary camera. What bothers me about this is that in the past eight years, since then, we really have seen an uptick. We're not imagining it in what I call cyber-inspired crimes. We've seen murders, suicides, gang rapes, but mostly a lot of violence and murder on live feed, based on YouTube, based on people wearing chess cams and uploading it to Instagram, and certainly doing it on Facebook Live. And you have to worry, and this is brought out in the documentary, is our obsession with catching everything in the moment live and being the first one to know it, the first one to break it, the fear of missing out, are we actually inspiring people like Luca Magnata to commit crimes, including murder? We are seeing a lot of people not only do attention-seeking things, but offer what we call contraindicators, things that will throw the police off their trail. And we saw Luca Magnata do that, playing a video of Russian language in the background, trying to make people think he was in Russia. And this means that you have to be about five layers ahead of criminal psychology in trying to solve a crime. Luca Magnata is one of those amazing, almost perfect case studies where you have so many different variables that created the monster that is Luca Magnata that it's like an onion to peel back the layers is something that we can do in class, in a criminology class, and always again with an eye towards learning from it so that we can use that knowledge for the greater good.